everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how I did this portrait of Blue the Hungarian Vizsla. And with any portrait, once I've done the background, I will always then start off with the eyes first. And my first tip when drawing the eyes on breeds like this is really pay attention to the colour of the outside of the eye. Now normally you may have to use a black to outline the general shape, but with the breed here, they tend to have more of like a reddish brown coloured eyelid. So I didn't want to go down with black to start with and risk going too dark. So that is one of my first tips here. Now of course this is going to potentially be the case with other breeds but it is more noticeable with this redger fur colour. The same will go with their nose and we'll get to that shortly. It'll be the similar with yellow Labradors and chocolate labs. They'll have the same sort of eyelid colour as well. And it seems really obvious to point out because obviously the reference photo there has given us all the information we need on what colour should go where. However, it's very easy to go on autopilot, grab a black and then outline the eye. And when I'm working on any eye of any animal, I will always zoom in on my tablet to make sure that it fills the entire screen so that I'm paying attention to all these subtle variations. Okay, so when it comes to the fur, this breed here, it's got a very challenging colour to get right. Now the one thing here that's really important is you could get five, ten photos of the same dog and the fur colour is all going to be different to a degree. So we just want to go for as close as we can get it. Now I've recently uploaded a Highland Cow tutorial to my Patreon and that uses all of the very similar colours that I'm basing this portrait on here. So if that's of interest along with all of my other slower tutorials in pastels and acrylics I will link my Patreon in the description below. But my main aim when I'm trying to capture this fur colour is I want to get that beautiful saturation in place from the beginning. One of the things that can happen, especially with the fur colour of this animal, is that you can end up with muddying up of your layers. Now what that means is if you're finding you're putting some darker colours over the top of your vibrant colours and you don't have the right colour saturation down first, you can end up with a muddy layer. It's just where you don't have a strong pigment down, it then mixes with something like a black and then it does cause more of this darker, general muddying up of that one colour. That's something that on this I really wanted to avoid. The Hungarian Vizsla, these type of dogs, have that beautiful colour saturation. It's the main thing here that I wanted to focus on. I also found for this that my preference was to use my pan pastels. There are a couple of reasons why, but mainly it is because they are so well pigmented. I knew that I could get my brightest colours down first and then as I'm working on here with my pastel pencils, building up my values from there. Now when you're working with pan pastels, there are a couple of things to bear in mind. The first is I would always recommend using a spare sheet of normal printer paper to mix your pan pastels on. Don't pick up that pigment on your soft tools or your eye makeup sponges like what I'm using here and then directly apply that to your pastel matte paper you will end up potentially filling the tooth of the paper because you just have too much pigment of the pan pastel on your sponge. By mixing the colours on a spare sheet of normal paper first, you're going to then just not only get the right colour by mixing the pigments together, but you are going to take off any excess. It doesn't really cause much wastage either. I think that's one of the, the things that people think, well, what about all that pastel that I'm mixing on a spare sheet of paper that could potentially go on my portrait? And yes, that is a fair point. However, if you fill the tooth of the paper, you're not going to be able to put your pencil details on top and then there's not really any point at all because you're going to have to start the portrait again or use a workable fixative to apply tooth back to the paper. And in terms of wastage, I don't actually find that that happens too much because what I'll do is I'll apply my sponge to the paper and then I'll go back to my mixing paper with that, that standard printer paper and pick back up more of that pigment. So it is very, very minimal what is left on that sheet. I have used soft pastel sticks and the pan pastels for a while now and the pastel sticks do seem to really burn through a bit quicker than the pan pastels. So although the pan pastels are a bit more pricier, they do certainly last far longer. And for me, because they have such beautiful colour saturation and they blend so well, just as you can see here on my first base layer, for me they really are the main way that I now like to use for my base layer. Now one area that I really focus in depth on every tutorial on Patreon, because they are often real time, it's everything's much slower, I can sh really explain and show each process. You'll see here that I don't jump to my details first. I will put my base layer down and then I will build up the layers of pastel gradually. 
For me, this is really, really crucial. I don't want to be adding my brightest details too soon. One of the main reasons why is I will end up having hardly nowhere near as amount of depth in that fur as I should do if I was layering with the way that you're, I'm showing here. I'm building up all of these layers gradually and I think for something like this where you've got that beautiful colour saturation, you've also got a breed that's far shorter coated than something like a German Shepherd, I want to make sure that I've got the shine on that coat. That is all going to be based on your contrasts. You could have the colour spot on but if you don't have the contrast there, this fur is not going to look shiny or short. So it's really about finding the right balance. Now I do have a couple of videos here on YouTube that focuses on how to get the technique right for shiny fur. So I will link those in the description below if they're of interest. And one of those videos is of a black dog. However, despite this being a different colour, the layering process would be the same and the principles are the same. You know, working from dark to light, building up your values gradually and then saving those lighter details for your last layers is always going to be the best way for this type of fur. One other thing you'll notice here as well is I always work in small sections. This for me is one of the ways that I keep motivated and I never become too overwhelmed with the entire process. You may find yourself actually uh, sort of putting more work in a drawer and not finishing it because you get a little bit to that process where you think I don't know what I should do next. Quite often it's because we're working on a larger area, we're finding it's getting a bit too overwhelming so we just don't finish the work. Work on smaller areas, really scale it down, you know, focus on one or two square inches at a time and it will usually help get you for motivated and work better with that portrait. So at the start of the video I mentioned about the nose and here you can see that the nose colour is very similar to the eyelid colour. As I've mentioned some Labradors are also going to have noses like this and I do have a real time tutorial on a nose of a very similar colour on my Patreon channel. Although I'm working with the same principles from dark to light, just as with the fur, I want to make sure here, of course, that I've got the colour more on the warmer, browner, red end of the colour wheel compared to the blacks and greys that we may use for those darker noses. A big tip when drawing noses is make sure that you get the shape of the nostrils accurate. You want them also in the right place. If the nostrils are drawn too small or too large or they're not positioned in the right place it's going to completely change the look of the entire portrait because it will make the nose look really odd and because it's one of the main elements on the face it can really throw off the entire piece. You saw when I started the nose that I always map in the shape of the nostrils first and the outline of the nose itself. The reason why I do that is I like to make sure that again I've got all of my proportions correct before I focus on any part of the layering process. You also want the nose to look a bit wetter so you want your shadows to be nice and dark so the inside of the nostrils are usually the darkest element and then you want those brighter specks of detail where that nose is just catching the light to be nice and bright. What you may find is, is once you've got the nose about 80-90% complete as I have done here, I work on the fur around it. So if you find that that's something you like to do, then of course you can always go back to additional elements. I always say in my Patreon videos that I get an area about 80% complete because you never really know if it's finished until you've got the area around it in place. It's only now when I'm starting to get those values on the bridge of the nose and the muzzle that you may then think, well actually I could hype up my highlights on the nose a little more. So all of these decisions can be made throughout the drawing process, again making that portrait more photorealistic. One other video that I also have here on YouTube is the top tips for drawing realistic fur. And again, I will link that in the description below if that's of interest. Now on what one of those tips, I really do speak about fur direction, fur thickness and fur length. That's going to be really crucial for any portrait that we're working on, regardless of the animal. If it could be a tiger, you know, a raccoon to a dog or a cat, any animal at all. You really want to be making sure that you've got that fur thickness, correct? So in terms of that, that's how much pressure you put on that pencil, how sharp that lead is and so on. The fur direction. If we get that slightly wrong to that reference photo, it is going to change the entire shape of the animal's face. The highlights and shadows are indicated by the underlying bone and muscular structure under that skin. So if we get those highlights and shadows in the wrong place, it will completely adjust what that animal's facial features look like. The other element is fur length. And I don't think this is spoken enough about in tutorials because if I was to be working on a Vizsla here and I make my pencil details too long, 
I'm going to make it look like a Vizsla, but it will be a long haired Vizsla. So it's really important to make sure that you're studying that reference photo closely and making sure that you've got those pencil strokes the correct length for any part that you're working on. The face fur is usually going to be shorter than the fur on the neck or the body. So it's really important about noticing where on that photograph you see that it's shorter compared to longer and then adjusting your pencil strokes accordingly. And in some cases, this may mean that you don't actually draw individual details at all. Look on the muzzle area there. There's not actual indentations. There's not really individual lines like what you can see below the eyes. That's because the fur around the muzzle is naturally shorter. And this is going to be the case on most breeds, most shorter coated breeds. Unless you're working on something, of course, like a cockapoo, they have got a lot more of that fur around the mouth. But with the shorter breeds, not just Hungarian Vizslas, any other breed, Labrador, Springer, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, you will find that the fur on the bridge of the nose and around the muzzle is shorter than the fur on the rest of the face. The one main thing that's going to affect fur length, fur direction and fur thickness is how you're using that pencil. Now again, this is something that I cover in depth with every tutorial on Patreon because it's that much slower footage, you're able to really see exactly how I move in that pencil. The way that you hold that, whether or not it's closer to the lead or further away at the end of the barrel, whether or not you've got your hand positioned at 45 degrees or 90 degrees, the length of the lead that you're using, all of these things make a difference and I will make that decision based on the fur texture that I'm trying to create. And the main point to that is how I use that pencil, it's never random. I'm not just holding it because that's the way that I hold the pencil normally. It is because I'm trying to concentrate on one type of fur stroke in that area. And the way that I use the pencil is going to vary depending on the animal. So it will be very different working on this Hungarian Vizsla compared to something like a long haired Spaniel or something like that. That's going to require a very different technique shown perfectly in the Highland Cow tutorial that I've just uploaded. Since I've shared this to my social media, I have had a couple of Patreon members asking me if I can feature a Hungarian Vizsla in a full-length tutorial on Patreon. So that is coming up. I'm just going to be searching for the reference photo. So I will post here on YouTube when that is live on my Patreon channel. So here is a photograph of the finished portrait. I really hope the tips and techniques that I've shared here in this video are useful. If they were, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube very soon. And as always, thank you so much for watching.